from Microbe TV. This is Immune, episode number 40, recorded on December 29, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Durham, North Carolina, Steph Langle. Hey, hi there. Good to be back. Looking forward to getting through some more emails. We have a lot to get through, but they're great. They're really good questions people are posing. They are. Mm-hmm. From Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. And from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hi, welcome back. <laughs> We're all home. Well, I'm not home, but you can see the other three are, are home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Still, Which is, uh, <laughs> after all this time, <laughs> still working from home. So this is episode 40. It's a nice number to round off the year, right? It is. I know. It's a good number. <laughs> it makes me it's happy. A, I like even numbers. You do? I do Must too. Must be a lucky number. Steph, I have yeah. to tell you, uh, the thermostat in our home has to be on an even number. It does. <laughs> and when people change it, I know they're trying to bug me. My wife is always you know, putting it on. Oh, that's 67 funny. or 69 and I put it right back in my car. They're all even. Then if I take her somewhere and I'll notice later, she's changed it to an odd number. Just, you know, obviously it's just a silly thing. <laughs> that's good though. I like an even <laughs> number. Okay. I'll keep that. I'll keep that in mind in case we want to okay. tease you. If you want to play jokes, it's a good way to do it. It's so uh, <laughs> 40 is great. Tomorrow Twiv 700. That's pretty good. Oh, wow. wow. Really? We reached that. That's within, crazy. Within how, many, how, many did you, how many have you done in uh, 2020? Um, well, we did 600 in like March or April, Brienne. Is that right? Yes. So we've done over 100. I have to count them up for tomorrow's episode. Wow. Oh. Yeah, we did That's a lot. Right. And at some Exciting. point we have to cut back. It's too much. <laughs> but uh, anyway, even numbers. Yeah, you're uh, keeping yourself very busy this year. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, it's just because of the pandemic to inform people, but uh, yeah. at some point we will you know, not slack off, but do fewer episodes because yeah. I don't think we'll need them. But we did uh, 14 this year in we uh, have. Immune, right? That's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah. More than once That's a month. That's awesome. Yes. More than and once a month. I looked back today and from March onwards, all COVID related. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I right? know. We, I think, you know, eventually we'll get to talking about other things. In, in immunology, I was listening to this week in virology, and there was a your most recent episode was uh, I forget ASTH meeting, and you were talking ASTMH, about ASTMH, yeah, ASTMH, mm-hmm. and they were talking about arboviruses, so yeah. the viruses that transmit through um, vectors like mosquitoes, and it was just great to hear something non-COVID. I just enjoyed it yeah. so much. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, we should get back to. But you know, half <laughs> the downloads of other episodes for that one, right? Because yeah. people yeah. don't want to hear about. And that's the way it's it's going to be, but that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But yeah, that, I just I did remember that, uh, when we first started doing these uh, on, <laughs> on COVID back in March, we were like, "There's really nothing known about the immune response. Really, we could talk yeah, basically about immune responses to viruses, but we really don't know anything." It's just astounding at how much mm. information we have now. So, Cindy, do we know everything? No. <laughs> do we know fifty percent? What what fraction do we get? Oh I gosh, mean, uh, how am I going to predict that? Is there a, uh, how much more do we have to know? I think think we we know a lot of key information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there are two views, right? First, we're making a vaccine and this is hopefully at some point we'll take care of the problem, right? But then there are interesting fundamental questions that remain Mm -hmm. to be addressed by still studying the virus and and infections of people, right? Yep. Right. And and I think that one thing I've learned over the past year is that sometimes we don't know what we don't know um, until sure. um, something you know strange happens in patients or something unexpected happens and we start to investigate it and unravel a whole new area to study. Absolutely. Right. And a lot of these, the numbers, like your R not or herd immunity number, and it, they're all um, moving targets. They're population dependent numbers. And so I think uh, a big point of conversation was, you know, if a scientist or public health official states a number that they that they believe, based on our best knowledge, would be what we need to reach herd immunity. I mean, that isn't set in stone. And mm-hmm. as we learn more, that number will change. So it, 
it's, I think that's hard sometimes for the public or, or somebody not in science to understand is that science is a nuanced, evolving, you're always trying to prove a hypothesis. No, nothing is ever proven. You're trying to build evidence, uh, you know, for or yeah. against the hypothesis. So I, so I was having, I was having drinks with some friends last night on Zoom and oh, I was going to say really, social distance. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> but uh, a very interesting point was made and that is that we are really um, accustomed to thinking about things we cannot see. And I think we take that for granted a lot. Mm-hmm. And so, you yes. know, people people who live not in our world only like see things and understand things that they see. But we're used to like we're used to thinking about things and understanding and believing things that we actually can't see. That's right. That's right. That's and absolutely I, right. Yeah. I, I I thought I just thought that was fascinating because I hadn't really thought about that that cl- carefully before, but it is so true. And so when we try to describe things like what you were saying with that moving target of herd immunity, people don't see it. It's not something they can look at and understand. You know, we make diagrams of it, but it's still a conceptual concept. Yeah. And when it changes yeah. and it's not a static thing that you just learn and move on, that's a very difficult space to live in and we live in it really comfortably because we've been trained that way but the public doesn't and that's something i think we don't we don't consider enough when we're trying to communicate with them right like if we have more empathy uh, about that Mm -hmm. that's a key part of science communication i think because um, mainstream media wants a black and white answer right absolutely right and we don't, and that's why we're always saying, wait, that's not quite right, and um, makes for a lot of discussion. But um, science communication makes- is extremely nuanced, and you that's why we do these podcasts to try and give people an idea. And it's not – you're not going to learn it all in one episode. No. Right, and, and I think that if nothing else, I hope that people are learning more about science as a process um, right. throughout this year and the fact that um, – Sometimes I see with my students, they expect that the information that I'm teaching them out of a textbook, you know, that someone just gave me that textbook. They don't think about where did the knowledge in the textbook come from. Um, And here we are building new knowledge and going through the process. And I'm hoping that at the end of this, the public understands the process and thinks of science not just as a textbook full of things to memorize. Yeah, I I think we um, Mm -hmm. go ahead. Oh, I was to say, we thank people for sticking around for multiple episodes because of what Brian said. It, it's not going to be all in right. one episode, but you stick with us. Hopefully yeah. we can, you know, help you learn. I wonder if you guys could tell me what you think are a, a key immunology discovery with COVID this year. I'm sure you've thought about it. Mm. I mean, something that stands out or, or not, maybe. Steph, what do you think? Well, I think, well, it's interesting because you know, we had talked about don't put all your eggs in the spike basket in the initial beginning of this vax of the vaccine development. And I anticipate that spike protein, because of what we've known from previous coronaviruses, would um, provide protection, at least in the shorter term, because we see that in animals. I, I don't know if I anticipated a 95% efficacy um, mm-hmm. in preventing severe disease. I, I really, I was hopeful for 70 um, 75, 60, maybe just because of the diversity in people. But when, when those numbers, that really was, I was really surprised by that. Yeah. I I think I, oh yeah. We were were all skeptical. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to say for me, I think I was somewhat surprised about the multiple papers that show that there's a group of people that get infected and don't develop a good immune response. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, if you're immunocompromised, that's one thing. But if you're a generally healthy person, one would think that you would generate an immune response. And so there seems to be these people who don't or develop a very poor immune response. And I think to me it was somewhat surprising, although not that surprising given that we realize that immunopathology is one of the key things that's causing severe disease, but just that the people who responded more poorly did better. What do you think, yeah. Brianne? So to me, I found three things really fascinating um, in immunology this year. Um, one of them is thinking about what makes an immune response um, last for a long time or not, mm-hmm. what what controls that longevity? Why are some of these immune responses to, to coronaviruses, um, you know, lasting perhaps uh, less long than we might expect? Um, and the papers looking at um, 
the germinal centers um, in mm-hmm. patients were, were really cool. Um, I've been really interested in some of the papers about autoimmunity, um, like the anti-interferon antibodies, um, and sort of some of the the autoimmunity and autoantibody questions that have come up about um, long haul COVID and things like that. I think that that's mm-hmm. a place where we're going to be learning more immunology in the future. Um, and this one may be just more of a brand didn't know kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> But I also have feel like I myself have learned a lot more about the interconnections between the immune system and the uh, coagulation system. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And how both sort of – I think that that has become something that's come to the forefront um, and is something that the immunology community is going to be looking at more closely um, as we see how it's affecting this disease. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, the other yeah. thing I wanted to mention was because we don't often see diseases – you know, in these numbers, this is what a pandemic allows for is for you to identify rare events. So I was surprised mm-hmm. to really learn more about things like multi-inflammatory um, system or syndrome rather in children and then adults um, maybe relating to this long COVID. And maybe we're yep. going to be able to give names and um, to these diseases that people are experiencing you know, long-term effects of viral infections that it's difficult to pick that up if you don't have the numbers you see with, with COVID-19. I think one of the other things that I really liked and also am saddened by (laughs) somewhat is Mm -hmm. uh, Cornell's response was just amazing in developing the testing and keep being a a model for how to do the Tetris, you know, testing and and trace back and things. And and really there was zero transmission in the classroom and they kept it almost to zero in the entire student and faculty population during the time when they had the classes open. What's sad to me is that that is a model of how to do public health. And we knew this before, but yet it's not, it's not accepted and being done everywhere. I mean, this could, this is avoidable, right? And that's, that's what is really sad. However, I must point out that the initial plan from your president, I get the emails as an, as an alum. I know. She did not plan to do much testing. She said, we can't afford it. And we, I was very critical on Twitter. I said, it's not mm-hmm. an excuse. And I'm glad they changed I that. I don't know what they the did. impetus was, but it's good. Did they well, look at Duke? I do know Duke had a very yeah. successful testing program that <laughs> they were able to limit transmission, not to, you know, to Duke's horn, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A number there of schools were. have been good, but others yep. have not. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So am I, the one So the first general aspect of immunology and COVID, I think that's the science that has been the most prolific, frankly, because even on TWIF, most of the papers we have done are immunology related papers Mm -hmm. because there's Mm -hmm. just not much fundamental virology being done in this first year. There's some stuff, for example, on the origin of the virus, phylogenetics, some stuff on cleavage of the spike protein structures, Mm -hmm. but most of it is immunology, which to me reflects that That's what we needed to know, right? How long Mm -hmm. is an immune response going to last? What kind of immune response is it? And so forth. But the most, if you ask me to give you one thing, the one thing that stands out for me is this paper where they showed in people with severe COVID, people who have died, no germinal center formation, no memory Mm -hmm. is a kind. And that just is an amazing observation, but also helps teach how the antibody response develops and persists, right? It's a right. beautiful teaching experiment. And, and then people have said since they're not sure of the generality of it, but I learned True. so much from that. But but that's a paper that is definitely going to make its way into my course in the spring, yeah. um, at yep. least yeah. in terms of figures of germinal centers, um, and things like that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, then the second one that I really enjoyed was the paper where in mice they compared uh, protein and mRNA vaccines in terms Mm -hmm. of generating memory, right? And so the mRNA vaccine made a great memory in the protein base, just naked protein, no adjuvant, very little. So I think that was very important also. I wonder, I think we all could agree that the science of mRNA vaccines, I mean, I know it was a platform coming into 2020. There were other vaccines under development with mRNA, but I, I, I just put it in the same realm as well. It probably will do just as well as a yeah. protein vaccine. I think the speed that you can implement, you know. That's no, great. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. No, for a new a new virus, you can imagine that that would be great. And I think as we've 
talked about on Twitter, they should try it for influenza vaccines. I mean, yes. It just seems like yeah. it would be a no-brainer. I just want to know who decided in January, somebody within Moderna or what, to say, let's do this, right? Because within weeks, they had a whole a going. And that was very brave. I that think. was very brave. I think their relationship with the Vaccine Research Center at yeah. Yeah. NIH, you know, there are coronavirologists there. Sure. And I imagine that yeah. relationship. Yeah. So yeah. we heard from Kizmikia and yeah, right. Barney Graham mm -hmm. how they interface with Moderna and work very closely. And I can imagine that you have conversations early on. Let's try it. And I think also Tony Fauci's giving them encouragement. He said, you should try this and, you know, we'll put money yeah. behind it. Is really yeah, the fact, that, the fact that they were already working together on a MERS um, vaccine on that same platform probably really helped. So uh, we're going to do email today, but one more question I have. Oh, no, two more questions. Um, so do you, what, what are we, what's the end game here? Do we keep doing COVID on immune until we don't? Because I can imagine. They're gonna, I, I found today, you know, well, 10 cool papers that we should yeah. do. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. so so I think that one of the things we need to think about is just because it covers COVID doesn't mean it's not fundamental new information in immunology, right? Because yeah. we, we are finding those kinds of papers where it's not just this is a me too that it happens in, in SARS-CoV-2 infection, but the actually new technologies or new ways of asking questions or new information that's coming out about immune responses mm. to viruses, that's really quite important. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we could we could do, gosh, like a COVID roundup at the end yep. of an episode that's not dedicated to COVID. We could do, we could start like doing or try to do two episodes a month: one COVID, one non-COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if our schedules would permit that. I know pe more people do want more. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think that <laughs> I <know. laughs> uh, once I think once immunization or vaccination has its effects. Um, mm -hmm we probably can just do papers that really establish key concepts, right? And don't yeah. just measure yeah. immune responses over a right. year, two years, three years, you know, that's less right. interesting. But anyway, we'll see. We can but be flexible. I think, that, I think there is a good point here, though, is there is a lot of research coming out that's not COVID-related that's just getting yeah. sidelined. Mm -hmm. And it's right. sad that's a good point. A lot. Because a lot of labs have transitioned and mm -hmm, at yeah. some point they need to go back to That's what right. they were doing, what they're yeah. funded for, because we can't have everyone working on SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, right? That right. doesn't work. There are other issues out there right. that have to be addressed. There's a, there's a lot of really interesting things in cancer research, new technologies, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I think we could. Mm -hmm. All right. For one last thing. So, so uh, yeah. Steph, you got, you got vaccinated. Tell us I about did. that. I did. I <laughs> did. I was in the 1A category that Duke considered first line. So it was either frontline research, um, I'm sorry, frontline healthcare workers, people who work in um, with high risk patients or people who work with the virus, which I am one. So I did get the vaccine 11 days ago. Um, I got the Pfizer vaccine. I had only one si symptom, which was um, muscle soreness for 24 hours. It reminded me of a tetanus shot. I, it was like the influenza shot. I don't feel, I didn't, I don't feel any muscle soreness, but this one I did, but you know, people were asking me about the fatigue. I'm like, well, I mean, I'm up every two hours to nurse an infant. So like asking me about fatigue is like not really relevant, um, but I didn't feel overly fatigued. It was just the muscle soreness. So. Hmm. Um, but now by 11 days, I should be producing antibodies. I would imagine the median time people to start to develop antibodies is around this time, maybe by day 14, if I haven't, um, it will not change my behavior. I'm still masking social distancing for a couple of reasons, which we can discuss more, but one, there's a very minimal amount of people who've received this vaccine. I don't yeah. want to be the reason that somebody who isn't vaccinated gets ill. And that's because what we don't know about this vaccine, is does it decrease your ability or eliminate your ability to transmit the virus? So antibodies developed against this vaccine protect against severe disease, which is likely IgG dominated after the virus has replicated in your mucosal epithelium and then started to spread down to the lower you know, areas of your lung. I think that it probably, I mean, if I had to guess, I would, I would imagine that it doesn't limit, it lowers um, 
viral shedding. This is my hypothesis. But I don't think we're going to have a sterilizing vaccine. I think it will, we will, people will still shed and it's going to require a high amount of vaccination to be able to mm-hmm. contain population spread would be my, my guess. So you have to go back for a booster in a couple of weeks, right? Yes. 21 days is the Pfizer rec- um, requirement. So I will go back next week. And, and even, I, the second vaccine's a little bit more reactive. You you ha, may have more reactive mm-hmm. genicity, so we'll see. But and, not and even after that, you will continue to mask and distance and so forth. Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> well, so that, that raises a really good question. Are there do you do you know of any vaccines that absolutely prevent any transmission? Because I, I I mean there really isn't a sterilizing immunity right because you can never fully prevent something from going into your cells. Do you that's, think? See, that's why that concept of sterilizing immunity. We mentioned measles a lot, but we learned from yes. Sally Permar and some of the literature that you, it's not sterilizing. You just have very high protection levels. So I I don't know if sterilizing immunity is just a concept and not. It doesn't right. Play out. I, I mean, I think that you know, anytime you have pre-existing immunity, you're going to limit replication of whatever organism it is. And mm-hmm. if that happens, there's going to be much less load. And if there's less load, there's going to be less transmission. You know, you're going to be shedding less, so there's less likelihood of infecting someone else. So it still works, but it's not 100 percent. Right. I and think I think popul- that's a challenging concept to discuss with the public as well. For sure. Yeah. No, they've they been that- told that these. Po- po- sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that I think that actually the way that we are thinking about that and talking about that now is also a sort of change in immunology um, mm-hmm. that's happened with COVID. You know, I, I don't know that I had put as much thought into are there any vaccines that lead to sterilizing immunity until we started talking about this. Um, this year. But but you don't need sterilizing immunity to have a population effect, right? right? Which we call herd right, immunity. Right. So people are now hammering me not to call it herd, to call it population Community immunity. immunity. Okay. 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 Oh. But we do know <laughs> that some vaccines will protect the unimmunized by reducing transmission. Right. Absolutely. And the, and the percentage of people that need to be immune to do that varies per pathogen. Measles is over Absolutely. 90% and others yep. are less. So measles, uh, smallpox, polio. So they must inhibit transmission to some extent. Otherwise, you would not see population immunity, right? Right. I think it's a difference between an overall population effect and an individual. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Because the individual could still shed some, but they'll shed less. So it's it's all a statistics ratio exposure. Yeah, because the idea of a population immunity is that when when a certain fraction is immune, you protect the others from infection. And why is that? Because you're not transmitting it to them, right? Because you're immune, but you, you need not be sterilizing immunity. That's, That's the right. point. Yeah. Right. Yep. Right. Well, it's the and same I with would the imagine. masks, right? Mm-hmm. You're reducing spread. It's not right. completely eliminating it, but if you reduce it enough, you're stopping the chain of transmission. I was going to say, I would imagine any immune response that would completely prevent viral attachment and entry into cells is a very strong pressure for that virus to evolve away from that. So mm-hmm. that's why I, and Vincent can comment on this since this is more his wheelhouse, but I would imagine that that's a moving target. The, vi- the virus is, I mean, the, it's going to evolve away from something that would completely block it, would be my guess. So you're saying that... You- in most cases, viruses retain some ability to enter cells uh, in the presence of antibodies that would prevent that. Right. So let's say that mm. IgA antibodies yeah. were the reason why X virus was unable to bind mm. and 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 again, IgA against, let's say, spike. I, I think that that's a strong pressure to for the spike to evolve to then be able to b- avoid IgA. Yeah, but and you always have to balance it with structural considerations. Maybe that kind of change would not be compatible with, you know, infectivity. Sure. But also, then right. there are post-entry mechanisms of neutralization which may be redundant or make up for it. So, right. I think it's not. Yeah, it's a bit complicated, right? It's nuanced, as I like to say. When I can't explain something clearly, I say it's nuanced. <laughs> <laughs> the it's other thing I out. wanted to say. 
it was interesting, Vincent, that you said the three examples you gave that, uh, of vaccines that prevent mostly sterilizing immunity or what we think would be close to it was mm. measles, smallpox, and polio. And what's mm. interesting, and those three are none of them are zoonotic infections, correct? Right. They do not spread to animals. That so, is a really mean, important point. Wait, wait, wait. Zo- zo- sorry. Zoonotic means they came from animals originally. Mm-hmm. It means they can go back and forth. Between no, no, it's a reverse animal. zoonosis if you go back into an animal. A zoonosis okay. is defined yeah. as yep. an infection acquired from animals. But, uh, you know, all viruses were at one point zoonotic. They came from sure. an animal, not because humans have been around not very long, right? So but, they may have there's been- There's no current animal reservoir. Correct. Polio, measles, and smallpox. Correct. There's no current it's, animal reservoir. So okay. it's interesting to think about how mm. circulating zoonotic in the sense that they, they have animal reservoirs um, right. would make it very challenging for us mm-hmm. to build up high levels of immunity. Um, yeah, so th- I, this well, is something I'm circulating around. It's interesting. Well, so, so we certainly couldn't eradicate anything that doesn't that has an animal reservoir. Right. right, because there always would be a chance of reintroduction. That's right. correct. Right, right, right. So that's I, why those three yeah. are eradicable in theory. In smallpox yeah, has been almost polio, and we could do measles, right? Yeah, but yeah, never SARS-CoV two yeah. or influenza or any nope. vi- MERS, Nipah, you know. Ebola. Yeah. 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 So okay. I had one more question, yep. and that's yep. because there's probably some immune listeners that don't listen to TWIV a lot, but we probably have a lot of crossover. And that is, I'd like to hear what you guys have to say about all the splash and press that's being given to the quote-unquote new variant, because I think there's a lot to say about this. <laughs> and I know you give- guys are making your faces, <laughs> but but I mean, this is, this is a real serious mm. issue that I think we need to educate our listeners on so that when they get into conversations, they can talk about it. Because... We're even seeing this in the New York Times. We're seeing this, you know, that countries are are locking down again because of hmm. this um, language going around that this is a more, you know, infectious, transmissible, ex- yeah. transmissible yeah. version give- <laughs> of the virus. So, yeah. We should just give the floor to Vincent. <laughs> no, yeah, no, no. I, I, but I think this is, I think this is really mm-hmm. important to I talk agree. about. I agree. Yeah, for so sure. this has been um, a dominant part of my consciousness for the past uh, two weeks. And <laughs> Brienne, I, I, when I, I will let Brienne speak because she probably she may not agree with me. And I, the thing on Twiv is that no one has to agree with me, but if I disagree, I will say it. Um, and th- there's some idea that this variant, the UK variant, is more transmissible. In my opinion, the data do not prove it. They're consistent with it, but what's needed has not been done. And to Mm -hmm. close down countries, to close people traveling based on something not proven, in my opinion, is ill-advised. It's premature, to use Tony Fauci's word. So what they found initially was that, you know, this variant, 23 changes in this variant, all of which individually had been seen before, but none altogether. Okay, so what? (laughs) Does it confer a new phenotype? That's the question. And they looked at PCR, uh, R naught, not R naught, but uh, you know the number of people who can be infected and RNA levels by RNA seq when they extract nasopharyngeal swab RNA and they sequence how many copies do you get? And they said based on all of that, you know the infectivity has slightly increased in this UK outbreak. There's more RNA by PCR and by RNA sequencing. And in my opinion, that does not prove, I mean, so if if you see more transmission, right, it could be that the virus now has new properties that allows it to transmit better. What would that be? Easier to get into cells, higher output from the cell, which would make it easier to infect another person. Mm -hmm. We don't have any of those data, but there can be other reasons why Mm -hmm. a virus is apparently more transmissible. For example, if it becomes less virulent and people get less sick and they walk around more and they transmit it, but nobody is considering that for -hmm. this variant. They're saying it's more transmissible and therefore we have to shut down the country and travel. Now, what I would like to see, I mean, first of all, you could imagine that these mutations in the genome came together in this virus and then there was a subsequent outbreak in the UK. And Daniel Griffin told me last week you know, their masking and, and, so, and physical distancing isn't very good there. They like to go to 
bars and so forth. And, and so, so there was an outbreak and it so happened right. that this particular genome got in and it propagated through because that's how it works. And now people are worried. And I think the PCR and the sequence data are not meaningful. I think you can imagine, these are not measuring infectious virus, okay? Right. And uh, I would like to see measurements of shedding from people with this variant and without. That's one thing. Also, the variant has been seeded into other countries. Let's see what happens there. If it's more transmissible, if it sparks a big outbreak or not. Um, and look at other reasons why increased... So I'm very circumspect. I'm saying we don't have the proof and people are nailing me and hammering me like crazy. They're sending me emails left and right saying mm -hmm. I've sure. jumped the shark. I don't know what I'm talking about. And I don't get this, but that's an, another story. I just don't think we have the data. And, and part of the issue is, you know, earlier this year, another variant emerged, D614G, a single amino acid change in spike predominated globally and people say, oh, it's more transmissible. They found in cell culture in the lab, produced more virus. I'm not impressed by that. I don't care about cell culture in the lab. It's not your respiratory tract. They found slight increase in transmission of that variant in hamsters in the lab. A few hamsters, a slight increase, but again, you're throwing the hamsters in a cage for three days. To me, that bears little relevance to people. I think you need to collect data from people. And we haven't done that. We just make inference, indirect inference. And, you know, we can do all the bioinformatics you want and you can say this or that. You can get whatever answer you want. I, I just saw a paper today where they concluded pre-UK variant, no variant of SARS-CoV-2 increased transmission. And here, you know, D614G was supposed to be the one. All right. So now we had D614G supposedly increasing transmission. Now we have the UK variant. And there are other variants derived from it which are supposed to be more transmissible. What's the end game here, which just keeps getting mm -hmm. more and more transmitted? This is, doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at it from a biological perspective. I want to see what data you have. And now Ian Lipkin said to me this morning, he said, I agree with you, but you know what? The UK government needed to make a decision. And so they erred on the conservatives. Okay, let's assume this is right. transmissible and then we'll, we'll do the right thing. And maybe in a public health situation, that's the right thing to do. That's what I was going to ask you. Uh, you know, what, where, where do you draw that line? So, yes, it might be. Yes, it might not be. But is it better to preemptively try to reduce you well, know, the transmission thing is, in the population by locking down? Here's the thing. Or do you wait for more data? Here's the thing. The question is, if it's more transmissible and more people die, that's a problem, right? But we haven't seen that in the UK. Not more people are dying. It's the same fraction of people who are dying as before. So I agree that if it's going to lead to more deaths, that's an issue. Because really, in the end, that's what we're worried about here. People overburdening the hospitals and dying, right? Because they can't get the proper mm -hmm. care. And I see, and I think that probably factored into their decision. And that's a public health decision. And I I but I think the media are blowing it out of proportion. They're concluding that oh, it's yeah. more transmissible. And I don't think that's correct. And I'm criticizing them, which in turn is getting me criticized. But I'm just being a scientist, you know. And Anyway, what do you think, Brian? <laughs> um, so sort of what I've seen is that there is uh, – a conclusion that this virus is more transmissible largely based on genetic sequences and epidemiologic evidence. And we're in a little bit of a weird situation because we've never had this much sequence at this mm -hmm. point of an epidemic with any yeah. other virus. And so right. we can't make a comparison um, to know what kind of diversity we usually see um, and what kind of variants we usually see arising at this point in, the, in an epidemic. Right. Um, and I am not an expert in viral evolution or uh, things like that. Um, so most of the types of evidence I'm used to looking at, as Vincent said, are not present here. Um, people who are experts in this are feeling like there's something going on with changes in viruses, uh, change in virus sequence and changes in numbers of infection. Um, I can't say or not say, I, I am that's their expertise? Sure. Um, I, I can't understand um, all of those data. I think that I what I've seen supports the idea that we should do some more experiments. Um, and I would like to <laughs> see more and try to understand more about what's going on. I think that, and so 
And I think that if you read what most scientists are saying, even in the sort of popular press, most scientists are being relatively circumspect Mm -hmm. in terms of saying, this is possible, we should do more experiments or something like that. I think the the problem comes in (laughs) with how that's being translated um, in some of, with some of the general public. Um, No, this virus does not get around masks. Um, no, some of your mitigation strategies that you might have originally thought of are suddenly don't go away. Um, fortunately, all of the same things that would protect you against the regular SARS-CoV-2 also will protect you against this virus. Um, and I think some of the, the sort of scaremongering is a problem. Um, yep. I, If the UK... Uh, folks were not following some of the guidelines um, as closely as they should have been. I'm glad that they may now follow them a little <laughs> more closely. <laughs> um, I also think that you know the UK was doing a lot more sequencing than anyone else. And mm-hmm. so this is being called the UK variant because it was found there. That doesn't mean that it wasn't in all sorts of other places already who weren't doing as much sequencing. And so immediately shutting down travel sort of seems, Vincent says premature, I almost say too late. Um, the, the virus <laughs> has probably already spread um, yeah. to quite a few places. Um, yeah. It's just, this is when we picked it up. Um, yeah, right. So I think that the same mitigation and the same public health strategies that were needed before are needed here. And we need to mm-hmm. um, focus on those as much as possible. Yeah, in fact, after the D614G variant was said to be more transmissible, nothing different happened. We just said mass, right. distance, reduced numbers, we should do the same thing. It really makes no right. difference in the end. I just want to tell one quick story, which I've told a couple of times on TWIV. And and that is, so as Brianne said, we have a lot of sequence data, which we never had before. And we don't frankly know what to do with it. You know, you can make mathematical models all you want. But in my view, this is a biological entity and it goes by genetics and phenotypes. Um, so we still can't do experiments in silico. I'm sorry. So back in 1900, polio's epidemiology changed. It went from a sporadic disease to an epidemic disease. All of a sudden, there were outbreaks of hundreds and then thousands and tens of thousands of people every year getting paralyzed. That had never happened before. Mm-hmm. And I swear, if we had genome sequencing in 1900, <laughs> they would have blamed it on mutation. Absolutely. They would say, oh, look, there's an amino acid change in the receptor binding site must make it more transmissible. Well, we didn't have genome sequencing. So they had to do some hard epidemiology. And it turned out that the reason was a change in sanitation. Pre-1900, every baby at birth got infected with polio because feces was everywhere. Human feces was everywhere. There were no sewers. There were no toilets. You got infected. Your mom's antibodies prevented you from getting polio. Then we improved sanitation, so now you didn't get infected at birth. You got infected when you were a couple of years old, and then there are thousands of kids of that age, of that cohort, boom, you get an epidemic. Beautiful epidemiology, yeah. not blaming the genome. And so I think that's what we need to do here. There's something else going on. And you know, the, the epidemiologists, the phylogeneticists are, are saying this is how it is, but where is the biology? That's all right. I'm saying. I'm not saying you know, don't be careful. I'm not saying don't look more. All I'm saying is give us the biology. And then they're, they're saying you're, you're full of it. So mm-hmm. well, <laughs> I, think- I would like, just like to have a conversation with one of those phylogeneticists and sit down with them and have them go through that data with me. Yeah. Um, well, they're because convinced, clearly Brianne, they have some gonna, expertise. They're going to be convinced clearly. of their view, yeah. Brianne, right? So I think the difference that we're seeing here is an academic question versus a public health question. Yeah, for is sure. It, mm-hmm. it, and and so we can't wait for the data that we want. What do you, but what should right? we do? That's true. What should we, we do, Steph? S- so if I was a public <laughs> health official and I'm sitting down with, I, I would have you on my panel, but I would also have people who are, you know, phylogeneticists and people who are looking at, at um, the genetics. And I, I would, you know, we would have a conversation. I think what Brianne said is really astute that this is probably already spread and locking down necessarily is not I guess a hard lockdown is not going to do much as that virus is already spread amongst the population likely. But what we you continue to do is the this kind of, you know, not hard line shutdown, but you're masking, you're showing, all these things we've been doing. And that's probably the middle ground. That's probably what you would should do going forward. But I think 
from what I understand of the politics in the UK is that they were slow to do the semi lockdowns, and this was a reason to do yeah, it yeah. to to move right. forward. Now, so, I've gotten a number of emails from the UK, people saying that oh, the PM didn't do it, so he used this as an excuse. Right. In part. Right. So so it's yeah. probably not a scientific decision. It was probably a public a pol- you know a a PR decision. Well, if you look at the Last week on Twitter, we, we, there's this Public Health England document that comes out every week summarizing the data. And at the end, they said, we have moderate concern that this has increased transmissibility. And that went from, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. no nuance in any press report, right? So that's part right. of the problem. That's what I try to neutralize. So you know, back off well, and look I, at the data. I think this the difference between learning this information now than if we were to learn this in March. So we know a lot more now that mm-hmm. we would not have to do a, a hard lockdown than we did maybe in March. And I guess the other point is to say, I would push back a little bit on, I do think it matters that things are more transmissible in animal models. I think it contributes to the evidence that it is phenotypically different. But of course, we would need what Vincent said, the epidemiological data, actually human data to prove that. But I don't think we can discount that. I guess, Vincent, what you're saying is to make a decision just based on hamster data, but sometimes that's all we have is animal data. So it's like, do you wait for this yeah. data? Or well, do we you didn't make a do anything now? with... We didn't do anything different with D six fourteen G. You know, that's true. Mm-hmm. Back in February or March, the headline, the paper, the first version was an alarming increase, right? And in the end, you just have to mask and distance and non pharmaceutical yeah. interventions. I think, I think if they you put me on that. your committee, <laughs> Steph, if I'm on your committee, I would say, look, yes. I think we need more data, but if you want, do tell people to do more masking and, and distancing and so forth. Right. That's fine. Right. Right. Right, right. I think the harm, though, in in doing if if what actually happened was the prime minister trying to make up for not doing it right the first time and using that as an excuse is that can do more harm than good because it mm. it erodes the trust in in the process in the development yeah, sure, of data sure, and sure. what we use to make decisions because it feels chaotic. And, it, it, it does. Like it feels. Not it feels like this whole thing. You know, like well, we didn't do it with the the other mutation. Why do we do it now? And so then the public becomes confused about why certain decisions are made because there's no consistency in how information is applied to make decisions that, for public policy. And so I think that 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 is a risk. Mm-hmm. I think there's a real problem because. In the end, we don't understand what the changes do biologically. Even D six fourteen G, we have no idea. Yet it's in a, you know this UK variant has D six fourteen G, right? It has. So it in it. Mm-hmm. you know it arose early on and it just spread and it's probably neutral, so it stays. There may be a slight mm-hmm. advantage, but it may not have to do with transmission. Who knows? It's right. really hard to find yeah. out because in the end, you just use animal models, and I don't entirely say you can extrapolate those to people. Right. But I do think a very simple experiment is a shedding experiment. Mm -hmm. You know, right now we have places where the variant is and the UK variant is or isn't and just takes washes, nasopharyngeal washes and do an infectivity, not PCR. It doesn't answer the question. Just measure infectivity. It can be done, but they never did it for D614G. They did a Mm -hmm. PCR experiment, which I, Mm -hmm. that's all I'm asking. I think from an immune perspective, what we can Mm. say is that the vaccines that we are, you know, rolling out, Mm. They, you, you can have confidence that they would also protect against this yes. variant yeah. from severe disease. If, if that yeah, is our important. endpoint, that is what's been trialed. That's important to think to to remember. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. I think right. the, one of the things we should do is get everybody vaccinated, right? Mm-hmm. Not worry about more transmissible. Just vaccinate people. Yeah. If if we stop the spread of this virus, the virus will not have as many hosts in whom to mutate. You know, part right. of the issue is. The press, the mainstream media, they want headlines, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. More transmissible variant. They don't want a headline, which if I, in my view, if they had spent the amount of wordage promoting vaccines, it would have been more beneficial. But yeah. they're not interested because people are not, they're not going to click on that headline, right? That's they're going to click on a headline that says more uh, more transmissible. And I think that's <laughs> a, a default with the, the way mainstream media works. It's it why, true. you know, there are for-profit um, organizations and and we're not. We just want to tell you what's going on. So I have w- I have one more question to throw into the <laughs> basket to 
When when do you think that we'll actually get a uh, general rollout of the vaccine? So you were in that one A one whatever population, yeah. Steph. But for the for those of us hunkering at home that don't absolutely need to be there or are right. not one of the high risk groups, because I'm looking at the fact that the, the, they originally said they would get 20 million doses out by the end of the year, and they're at about two, so we're about one tenth where we said we would be. And if we need to vaccinate, let's say 50%, 50% of the Americans are saying that they'll get the vaccine. So 150, 160 million people. Even if we were at 20 million doses per week, 160 million doses, uh, you know, and everybody needs to get it twice, we're still talking quite a while into 2021. What's your prediction? Do you think we can ramp up manufacturing, get this out? more widespread? Well, you know, it would be nice if we had some other vaccines, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's happening with the AstraZeneca, but now another uh, Novavax's vaccine yep. has gone into phase three. So in a couple of months, they should have results because there's, you know, infections are still ferociously high. So that's yep. good for that. But it would be nice to get more in the pipe. We don't, but I'm thinking summer is is when we're going to have a good fraction of the population immunized. But that's just a guess, a, a wild guess. <laughs> we have to we we'll have to have a, um, a betting pool, yeah. 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 Well, yeah, Steph's I, already got it. Vincent, you're probably <laughs> next, unless unless you're working so on what the is virus. The, um, Brianne, so I'm probably B, last. No. <laughs> I think I'm in Group One C. You know, 65 and uh, up. That's the third group. Of course, there's a there's a good. Uh, site, CDC site that gives yeah. all the criteria for 1A, 1B, 1C, and everybody else and so forth. And I'm a ways off, but that's fine. Um, I, I don't need to, someone offered to push me to the top today, but I said, no, I don't want to do that. I'll mm -hmm. take my turn in line. I'm, I'm okay. Take my chance. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, in general, it's not going to happen relatively quickly as people are hoping that we're going to approach this time where we can take off the masks, gather in large groups. This is all looking good. The, the vaccine data is looking promising, but we need to, you know, just keep persisting with what we're doing until we can identify what level of herd immunity, pop, sorry, population yeah, immunity. Okay. We need. <laughs> uh, herd is, it, it's hard to, to get rid of a word once it's stuck. I know. <laughs> well, the problem is that is an epidemiologic term. Mm -hmm. And they don't yeah. want to change from using that. But the public perception of their children being called a herd is not good. And so I've tried to. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's why I, I get an email from a push. veterinarian regularly who says this people are not a herd. Those are. Yep. <laughs> so stop using that term. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, no, I'll change. I'm always up to change. So that's fine. Population immunity. Yeah. Oh, wow. So I asked so many questions and derailed us from doing emails. No, okay. So we should we should attack a few of these. Yeah. But I, thought it was, I thank you for indulging me because those were questions that I think, mm, I think not just funny. I have. I think our listeners probably share a lot of people. Yeah, the curiosity is about these important topics. Well, I think we can we can't. There's nothing we can't talk about, right? As long as it's <laughs> science related. And sometimes we even do non-science, right? Although less here on immune than on Twiv. <laughs> um, okay, let's do some email. Let me take this first one because uh, it's about viruses mostly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Steve writes, hail to the immuni immuninati. Mm -hmm. Just listening to one of Simon Whistler's many interesting, amusing YouTube posts. You have competition and productivity and channel empire building there, Vincent. Okay, it's fine. When I couldn't help <laughs> noticing that all the examples of Pasteur's vaccination feats seem to be of him actually using his vaccines to cure, not just immunize animals and eventually people who were already sick. I believe that you have mentioned that some species like anthrax are slow growing enough for a vaccine to work if the infection is far away from vital organs for there to be time to train the immune system to attack it before it becomes lethal. But from this account, it almost seems as if Pasteur was applying a kind of homeopathic principle that a smaller amount of a poisonous substance can provoke the body into fighting off much bigger lethal amounts. What did Pasteur actually think he was doing? Did he theorize about an immune system? Did he really cure rather than immunize his patients? 
perhaps you can go into this in one of your podcasts, when we run out of COVID-19 discoveries. Amazed at all your wonderful output. Steve is in Luton, England, where it's chilly. 20C after a week of very sticky 30C sleepless nights. Air conditioning is rare in homes here, but it is catching on in cars where a lucky few can escape to on their way to work. <laughs> and it gives a link to this uh, empire building. Simon Whistler. So I really don't know much about what Pasteur was thinking, but I do know that, you know, uh, once you're bitten by a rabid animal, you have some time to be immunized before the virus reaches the CNS and causes its disease. Does anyone have insights about uh, what Pasteur? Well, there's was a thinking? whole. I, I I don't know what Pasteur was thinking, but I there's definitely this idea of um, therapeutic vaccines, which some people mm -hmm. say is an oxymoron because the <laughs> idea of vaccine is preventing <laughs> disease, right? But if you have a chronic viral infection, you know, one of yeah, the sure. uh, uh, or cancer, one of the goals is to break tolerance, and so is that. Mm -hmm. A really vaccine or is it uh, a just dif a different way of manipulating the immune system? I'm not sure if, you know, that's what we call it. But basically, if you can provoke a strong enough immune response to overcome whatever tolerogenic responses are happening in the animal or person, you can, in fact, you know, somewhat gener generalizably generate an immune response as a vaccine immunotherapeutic. What do you guys yeah. think? So I also do not know what Pasteur was thinking. Um, <laughs> and uh, I have seen the movie biography of Pasteur's life, but it was a while ago. So I'm now cursing my inability to remember. <laughs> um, but I know that there were um, lots of reports even before Pasteur. Um, the one that I cite sometimes in classes is from Thucydides of people knowing that um, the second time you were, or if you had been previously infected, with something um, and had managed to survive, then you had this protection. Um, and you can find that in a lot of ancient mm -hmm. writings. And so yes. they did not necessarily theorize an immune system, but this idea that a sort of a small amount will allow you to be immune um, to a substance was out there in a lot of different cultures for a very long time. And so he could well have been taking that idea um, and sort of tweaking it a little bit. I remember Jenner had been around long before and he mm -hmm. had the idea of preventing smallpox, right? Mm -hmm. By mm -hmm. immunizing you with cowpox pustules. So I right. think this idea of prevention was already well established. Now, yeah. now there are a lot has a lot has been written about Pasteur, and I'm simply not aware of it. So there might be much more than this, uh, Steve. But it would take uh, some you know, either having a Pasteur expert, which may be out there listening, if you want to come and talk about Pasteur, that would be great. Yeah, it'd be great. Yeah. So the part of this email that says Pasteur was applying a kind of homeopathic principle that small amount of a poisonous substance can provoke the body into fighting off a much bigger lethal amount. And you're really doing a great job of describing exactly what a vaccine does. And yep. um, it's taking a smaller portion of a more lethal substance to prevent that a larger substance from hurt, harming you. And I think indigenous peoples probably have had this down for many, many centuries. It's just that we did not document that in in Western or Eastern, mostly Western medical history. So um, I don't know. There is there is there is documentation in uh, ancient China that they mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Buddhist monks or something were taking pustules and grinding right, it right. up and snorting it right. to pr give protection of immunity. So it did it that did exist nasal in a IGA. general way. Yeah, <laughs> I, nasal I, I think IGA. I've heard both in ancient China and somewhere in Sanskrit. It's recorded, but since I can't yes. read those, I never cite them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Brianne, can you, can you take the next one? Sure. Anon writes, Perhaps it is just because I don't understand fully, but the study below where they infected 16 volunteers with 229E seems pretty much to fit the profile for SARS-CoV-2. Or maybe I missed the mark and risk some rack and yelling. Uh, the study. And then uh, we have a link to the study. The volunteers were administered with a nasal wash with 229E. They say 10 just became infected. Before you infected. move on, Brian, can you describe what 229E is so people can know what that is I as you're reading? I absolutely can. So 229E <laughs> is one of the human endemic coronaviruses um, that has been known to cause the common cold. Um, 
So the volunteers were administered with a nasal wash with 229E. They say 10 became infected as indicated by viral shedding measured by nasal wash, freezing at minus 70, and then cell culture. The uninfected group had elevated 229-specific IgA by nasal wash as compared to the infected group. Hmm. Of the 10 infected, eight got colds of varying severities and all had IgG and IgA come up more in serum as opposed to the uninfected group. They then rechallenged everyone a year later with 229E. The original uninfected five, it seems someone did not care to return, became infected as a measure as measured by the same viral shedding assay and or a rise in serum IgG. This and or clause seems to be missing from the original stratification criteria, I believe. One of these got a cold. Six of the nine that returned from the original infected group became infected again by the viral shedding and or serum IgG criteria, but no one got a cold. Everyone in the rechallenge that shed virus did it substantially shorter than the first go round. All told of the 14 that returned after a year, one got a cold. Though a small sample size, doesn't this seem to fit the current understanding of infections in the pandemic? Of 15, five were uninfected, but had an immune response and no symptoms, or is it signs? Of the 10 infected, eight got colds. So five plus two, or seven out of the 15, were asymptomatic, but generally mounted an immune response, and virus could be cultured from some of this group. The people that got a cold had varying severities and all shed virus, and none became symptomatic on rechallenge after a year. Would love to hear the experts chime in. Thanks. Um, so I, I love this study. This is one of the very few common cold current. I mean, the, one of the few challenge trials we have available to us. Um, but the fact that we they could do it is because, again, it's common cold. It's mild. Right. We would not want to do this with a more pathogenic no. coronavirus. No. no, not at all. But I think that the idea here of... Um, you know, some of these people who are listed as uninfected, in fact, truly being asymptomatic infections based on their making an IgA response is correct. Um, mm -hmm. And so the number of asymptomatics, um, the changes in uh, getting a cold the next year, the shedding of virus, all of that seems spot on um, as far as I can see. I would agree. Yeah, I, th yeah, I think it tells us what we know about common cold coronaviruses is that you can become reinfected. Mm -hmm. Maybe your symptoms are less, but that is why we have common cold coronaviruses every cold and flu season that reemerge um, and then wane again in the summer because you don't have full protective immunity. And this is the question I think we have for SARS-CoV-2, whether or not how long does durability last of these antibody responses, are we going to see reemergence of SARS-CoV-2 every season? Are we going to have to have booster vaccines? The, this study brings up those questions. I just love that it they didn't have PCR or any nucleic acids. They had to do plaque assays or mm -hmm. infectivity <laughs> assays, right? It's a very clear, there's no ambiguity to the results because they're measuring infectious virus. And I think it's really interesting that the uh, extent of shedding is shorter, which would impact transmission, right? Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And this study got a lot of, I mean, earlier in this year, Ralph Barrick said, you know, he would base his interpretation of what SARS-CoV-2 is going to do based on this, you know, maybe it'll end up being like this at some point sure. in the future. Who knows how many years, but that's what we have. Right, what, right. And what, so, it, mm -hmm. go ahead. Go ahead, oh, Cindy. Oh, I was just going to say one question I had was, if if some of the, I think there's some initial reports suggesting that even people who have gotten the vaccines that are out there, the mRNA vaccines, their antibodies are waning. Now we can come back to what does that mean? Do you have memory cells? Can you spike antibodies back up or whatever? But what I wonder about is if it goes down in, you know, three, six months and it takes us that long to get around to immunizing everyone, do we now have a more susceptible population again before we get everybody immunized? And how does that impact how this disease develops over the next two years? I don't think we can necessarily predict that or know what's going to happen because we've never been in a situation like that before. I mean, right. Hopefully, and, and go ahead. I, I was just going to say that, you know, this study shows us what happens with 
uh, immune responses to infection, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the immune response to the vaccine will be the same. Yeah, um, sure. And so That's trying right. to figure out what's up with the vaccine is going yeah. to be its own yeah. study. Now we have to learn that, right. but you know, as you say, the level of antibody is not important. It's what, what's important is the memory, whether it comes back really right. quickly right, after right, infection, right? right? And yeah. so if you're just measuring serum, although serum, as I've learned, serum IgG, if you do have a low level, that suggests uh, there, there's memory B cells present, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's good. They're clearly being established for these common cold coronas, even though they didn't have the technology to look for it back then. Right. But, um, I think really, the other, uh, oh, go ahead. No, the real, as you say, the question is what happens with the vaccine? You can't assume it's going to be the same as natural infection. It's just, right. just going to have to see, right? Right. And I think the other thing we're going to have to consider is if there's still going to be a, a population of people shedding, you might get like micro boosted occasionally from small exposures, yeah, sure. depending on mm -hmm. how we handle distancing and masking for the next few years. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? Probably a good thing. Because if it keeps tweaking your immune system and you, you boost, it's like a little booster, right? And then you'd be more protected if yeah. you have a, yeah. a larger exposure. It's interesting things to think about. I mean, it's also yeah. worth mm -hmm. looking at the last devastating pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. 1918 mm -hmm. influenza, which didn't go on forever. You know, the virus H1N1 influenza virus, first introduction into people. Huge pandemic for a couple of years. And then it goes away. And then there's yearly outbreaks of seasonal influenza caused by the same virus. It changes slightly from year to year, but never the same amount of uh, extensive uh, outbreaks as the 1918 was, right? And then eventually we learned right. to immunize and so forth. And that same virus spreads until 1957 when it's replaced by another subtype H2N2. So, and that was a much less severe outbreak. So from 1918 to 57, that same virus circulated, but it caused a fraction of the death uh, compared to the original one. So I think you know, we can learn from that. And, and it's likely that this virus will do the same. And we have ways of impacting this pandemic, which we didn't have in 1918. We couldn't make vaccines. We couldn't make any right. therapeutics. It was all about masking and distancing, which we weren't very good at. We just let it rip. So yeah. um, I, I think that's an important lesson that is forgotten often. Um, Steph, you want to take the next one? Yeah, sure. From Rick, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hello, immune team. Thanks so much for your informative podcast and for pivoting to devote so much recent effort to COVID related topics. Much of what I know about immunology I've learned from your podcast and from TWIV. I'm sure that many listeners are like me and benefiting from your clear explanations of complicated topics. Below are a couple of recent papers about immune responses to SARS-CoV-2 that you might consider for future episodes. And he lists three papers. One is from the Gleet Alter Lab. Um, the last, uh, the first author's last name is at Yeo, and it's called Distinct Early Serological Signatures Track with SARS-CoV-2 Survival. I had read that paper before, and it was a small sample size, I think only 22 people. So with only 22 people, you're not going to be able to see significant differences in convalescent versus people with severe disease. It's just not enough. Mm -hmm. But what they did find were strong responses to spike protein in people who were convalescent, suggesting protection. And greater um, antibody responses to the end protein in individuals who had um, passed from SARS-CoV-2, suggesting that not having a strong anti-spike antibody response could be the reason that those individuals succumb to disease. Of course, there's, again, with only 22, it's, it's hard to say. But the other interesting thing they did in that paper um, were f defining function effector functions other than neutralizing the virus. And those are called um, FC. So it's basically, if you have your antibody, it's the shape of the Y. The stalk, the bottom part, is can also in, um, impact protection by binding to innate immune cells like macrophages mm -hmm. and neutrophils mm -hmm. and enhancing their ability to fight infection. So it's not just the tips of the Y that are specific for the virus, but the bottom half, which is nonspecific. So we would call those nonspecific functions. And they define those nonspecific functions. And um, it's very interesting you know, a lot of times we think about an antibody either has neutralizing function, which is um, specific, or non-neutralizing function, function, which is non-specific. But I think what we need to start thinking about more is antibodies can have both. And what do those memory B cell populations look like that have both ability to, um, 
you know, engage with the virus in a specific way, but then engage the innate immune response. It's very interesting. Um, the other two papers are talking about neutrophil extracellular traps, which we did go over in one of our immune episodes way back when, but it's an ability of neutrophils to kind of just like vomit out its contents and trap the, the it's usually defined in a bacterial infection is where the right. literature really was based out of, but um, less is known about nets and viruses, but I guess there's some literature coming out in SARS-CoV-2. So um, anything else? Say thanks for your continued efforts, Rick in Maryland. Oh, and um, on TWIV683, for those who are interested, uh, the team did talk about antiphospholipid antibodies triggering thrombosis and neutrophil extracellular traps were involved. So we talked about SARS-CoV-2 uh, and COVID-19 as a disease that involves coagulation, endothelial cells, and thrombosis. And so maybe in, that pathog- in the pathogenesis, neutrophils are involved there. I should say tomorrow on TWIV, we're going to talk about some FC uh, functions related to COVID nineteen. Mm. Exciting F- fucosylation. Cool. Oh, that oh piece. yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was That's cool. I wanna... That is That's very very cool. cool. Yeah, Divert. we should talk about that on immune because not only are antibodies <laughs> that, they not only um, are are using their components to engage in their effector functions, but they have they're decorated with sugars called glycans yes. that also mm-hmm. can impact their function. So yeah, that's be cool. right. Talk about. Cindy, can you take Jim's? I can. Please? And one of the other things I was going to say from that last one is it it made me realize, I, I wrote it down later in our notes, but when I got to that point, I started thinking about it. We keep going, oh, that's a cool, cool thing. We should talk about that. Mm. Oh, we should cover that topic. But I think that we should create a, a list of the, these topics because we're getting great um, suggestions from mm. our listeners. And we keep saying, that's great. And then we we get sidetracked and, and we don't actually cover it. So I, agree. We I think should we probably, should create a list should, and check it twice. That's, that's right. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> okay. So the next one is from Jim and Jim writes, hi, immune folks, or perhaps you are no more immune than the rest of us, only more aware of it. Steph is more immune. I've just been a listening <laughs> just a little. <laughs> I've been listening to Immune and Twiv since April or March. I started with Twiv 598. Having studied the physical sciences and worked as an engineer, I am naive about all things biological, but I hope I am learning a lot listening to you. There is a question that nags at me. On one hand, I hear from you that SARS-CoV-2 is not found in the blood since it infects the mucosa. On the other hand, tests for antibodies look in the blood. This feels like a disconnect. How can antibodies in the blood protect against a virus that is not found in the blood? I expect that I will continue listening to both Immune and TWIV long after SARS-CoV-2 is no longer the central topic. Good, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you for your, the wonderful work, Jim, a mere mathematician. I would not say mere related to mathematician. <laughs> we all have our specialties. Yeah. Um, I, who, who wants to talk about this? Because I think this is a really important point. You know, when, you, when you've studied the immune system and you kind of understand how everything interacts, it makes sense. But when you're looking at it from the outside, something like this probably doesn't make a lot of sense. Maybe we'll lean on our teacher, uh, you know. Well, I guess both of you teach <laughs> okay, immunology okay. courses. Okay. So <laughs> well, do you, do you want to do you want to start Brian or do you want me to start? Um, I can start. Um, so we are looking for antibodies in the blood largely because that's the easiest place to look. Um, and that is where one particular type of antibody, IgG, is found pretty frequently. Um, But as I'm sure uh, Steph actually could tell us quite a bit more about, um, there are lots of ways that antibodies can move from the blood into other tissues. And there are also situations where there are B cells in other places making antibodies more locally there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so to add to that, there's, there's two things I think going on. The first thing is the second thing you said, which is once you make a B cell response in a secondary lymphoid organ, like a lymph node, 
the B cells that are generated there can go and populate the tissues, typically mm -hmm. a mucosal tissue. And they can sit there and they may um, have already, or I mean, maybe Steph can correct me, but they can further refine their uh, FC part that we were just talking about so that it becomes IgA. And that's a typical um, type of immunoglobulin that is secreted at mucosal surfaces and protects those surfaces. So that's one way. But the second thing that we need to remember is that in a lymph node, you have lymph coming in and out, and you also have blood coming in and out. And so from the blood, we usually have entry of immune cells. They'll exit through something called a high endothelial venule. They'll circulate around the lymph node. They'll do whatever they need to do if they need to expand or get activated or whatever, and then they might leave. But we also have lymph entering. And when lymph enters, it can bring antigens. That's one way you can generate immune responses. Or it can bring these antigen-presenting cells, like dendritic cells. That can also help to activate the immune response. <clears throat> but once the immune response is developed, the B cells that are producing antibodies can also secrete them so they can go into the exiting lymphatics or the efferent lymphatics. And then that will join up with the bloodstream later and get back into the bloodstream, and then those antibodies can circulate in the bloodstream. And then those antibodies can exit into the tissues and bathe the tissues because of changes in the, the blood vasculature in places where there's inflammation, for example. Mm -hmm. So if there's damage to um, the tissue, the blood vessels will become leaky so that the, the important components of the blood can get out into the tissue, and antibodies are one of those things. And so they can bathe the tissues. So although we might sample, as Brianne said, blood to identify those antibodies, those antibodies can still be circulating around the body and get out into the tissues and bathe the tissues and have functions in the tissues as well. Yeah, I kind of think of the blood in this case as sort of the highway that's connecting yeah. <laughs> all of the other parts of the body. Um, so we can find many immune uh, molecules and immune mediators in the blood, but the blood is not their main place where they happen to be doing their functions. Right. Right. And it's often that the blood uh, antibodies that you measure typically correlate to what is found in the mucosa because those are the cells that once they receive a signal, they receive their education in the lymph nodes, they're going to traffic to those sites. Um, so let's say we have high amounts of IgG for SARS-CoV-2. They have found a correlative amount of IgA in the mucosa tissue, in, mm -hmm. in the mucosa. So, I mean, you can fine tune that a little bit, but right, as Brian said, it's the highway and these cells traffic to get to the spots they need to go. I would just say to Jim that he says the virus is not found in the blood. It's, mm. It is at very low levels and we're not sure what that means if mm -hmm. it's spreading in any way through the blood to other tissues, you know, from the mucosa, the, the, the respiratory mucosa, but you can certainly detect it, but it's very low. It's not, it's not a main way that the virus gets around. For example, HIV-1, blood is a main way that the virus right. can get from person to person if you use contaminated right. blood, for example, because there's enough virus in there to initiate an infection. So significance of uh, virus SARS-CoV-2 in the blood remains to be seen. All right, let's go back to the top. Diane writes, hello, wonderful immune hosts. You are all just terrific. And since I'm never exactly sure when immune will drop, I inevitably squeal a little with happiness when it shows up. Always a lovely surprise. Then it's time to get pen and paper and commence listening and note taking. Mm. Wonderful. It's a great list. Dedicated. I love it. I have a quick question. What does T cell exhaustion mean? Uh -huh. Does it mean that you've run low on the, that sort of T cell? I'm guessing no. Or does it mean that individual T cells are well tired? <laughs> what would <laughs> actually it. be going on or maybe not going on in an exhausted T cell? How does cellular immunity recover from exhaustion? Thank you for all your work putting this show together. It's a labor of love that I so appreciate. Brianne's addition to the podcast since the pandemic started is fantastic as well. I love hearing smart women scientists talk science. Thank you, Vincent, for your amazing work to host all these podcasts and bringing these superstar people together. It's why I donate to your Patreon. Your podcasts are so valuable to me. And Diane is from Seattle with cold mornings, mild, warm afternoons these days. Thank you very wow. much for your support, Diane. And I will yeah, hand that you. off to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> First, thank you, Diane. Yeah, yes. thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, do you want to go? 
I can go. Um, so T cell exhaustion um, does not mean that you're running low on that sort of T cell. It is closer to meaning that the T cells are tired. Um, so T cells that have seen um, frequent chronic antigen um, or that have been stimulated um, with a lot of cytokine actually lose their ability to um, do certain functions. I think of this most frequently with CD8 T cells. So I'll be giving you the example of CD8 T cells, those cells progressively lose their ability to um, proliferate, to make cytokines, um, and to be cytotoxic. And eventually, they can actually um, become apoptotic. Um, we are starting to learn about some specific proteins that are on the surface of exhausted cells, um, like um, PD-1, mm-hmm. um, and um, potentially think about ways that we can uh, stop exhaustion from happening um, using um, some novel therapies um, directed at PD-1. Um, and so that's the sort of those exhausted T cells are in fact losing function. So that's what's not going on <laughs> in them. So uh, I guess if, if one wanted to give an example of this, it's like if you, uh, maybe a skunk isn't the best example, but if you smell something really <laughs> strong and after a while you don't notice it anymore... The smell is still there, but you're you become tolerized to it, I guess. But the interesting thing is, I, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Do you put a distinction between tolerized and exhausted? So I, I used, I, it's nuanced. It's very nuanced, and maybe a little more than Diane was asking for. But, <laughs> um, but. But generally, T cells will go around the body and they can be tolerized to certain things. And this this definitely happens in cancer. Um, and it has to do not only with the antigen expression being there, but also other signals that are provided, including the PD-1 signal. But the T cell exhaustion is more of um, in response to an, a, a, a strong stimulus, those cells kind of start to shut down after a while. But But I think the important, and I don't know if I'm babbling on here, but I think one of the important points that you you sort of make is these are, they're, they're exhausted, but they can be revived. And that's, that's one of the important reasons why we have these immunotherapies that target things like PD-1 with the, um, the immunotherapeutic antibodies that allow, they basically block those negative signals that the T cells are getting and allow them to become functional again. So I don't I don't know if you want to sort of add to that nuanced there sort of your thoughts on it. Well, I think that it's, it's the difference between whether a T cell undergoes tolerance or exhaustion. I think has a lot to do with the antigenic context that mm-hmm. it's in. So the chronicness of something, an infection, right. a tumor, m- more leads towards exhaustion. I think tolerance mm-hmm. is a very specific immunological process that starts from the beginning of right. the interaction with an antigen. It goes down a tolerance pathway. It's not that that antigen is chronically interacting with the T cell. So that's where I think that nuance comes in is what's the baseline, the antigenic context and what the T cell is being stimulated and if that antigen is around for a long time or not. Except that kind of Fails a little bit when you talk about autoimmunity, right? So you have some tolerogenic T cells to autoantigens, but if you break that tolerance, then you can have autoimmune responses. So that's why I was saying it's kind of it's, tr- yeah. a tricky, tricky line there. Yeah, it's one of those no, I, fun those, immunology things to talk about. Yeah, I would define things very similarly to the way that Steph defined them. Um, yeah. And you know, I and I learned exhaustion first in the case of um, T cell exhaustion in yes. response to viral infection. Yeah. Um, but certainly, you know, self antigens are chronically or always present. Um, so you could imagine that similar processes are taking place um, that could be part of tolerance. But I do think of them as being separate. Yeah, processes. yeah, because isn't because isn't the tolerance to a self antigen happening in the in the thymus right at the beginning? Mm-hmm. You have peripheral tolerance yeah, as well. Yeah, you have well. peripheral tolerance. Yeah, yeah, peripheral tolerance. Mm-hmm. Compared to, uh, yeah, I, I guess I'm just thinking it in terms of how is the antigen being presented to the T cell mm-hmm. to help define 
that trajectory. I, right, I think the very- difference for me would be, it, and, and so this again gets kind of nuanced, but it's an interesting discussion. The tolerance is presentation of the antigen to a T cell without any co-stimulation. And mm-hmm. so it becomes less, it becomes more resistant to the response if it actually gets presented in the context of co-stimulation. And I think that's important because of those exact reasons we just said, where you have an autoantigen. If now that autoantigen is also being presented in the context of like a viral infection where you have both antigens, you could mm-hmm. potentially risk activation of those sure. auto T cells, but they would be tolerized so that they wouldn't respond. But the exhaustion part is they they weren't previously told not to respond, but they did respond and now they've kind of gone overboard or been been shut down after. And so I again though, it's the exact mechanisms that are involved in all of the signaling processes and does a does an exhausted cell look like a tolerized cell or not? Are there different genes expressed and so I'm sure I, I should probably know this, but I'm sure there are people working on those comparisons and there are very clear genetic signatures involved in that. Um, but yeah, it's just an interesting thing to think about. Yeah. So mm-hmm. as you described that, Cindy, I think that I sort of came up with my own new definition um, where <laughs> the, um, the exhausted cell responded and then now doesn't and the tolerant yes. cell never responded. That's right. right. That's right. Right. I like that. We should yeah, teach me that too. now. Me too. I think that's a very a, a simpler way of what I was trying to explain at the beginning. So thank you to Brianne's immunology dictionary. It takes three <laughs> of us. Yes. <laughs> Brianne, you're next. Sure. Roman writes... Dear immune hosts, I'm listening to episode 34 from August 25th. One small terminological nitpick that really bothers me. There's no such thing as 67% homology. Homology is binary. Either two peptides are homologous, share a common evolutionary origin, or they are not. What you're talking about is sequence similarity, not homology. See, um, and then he gives a link. I also checked the original paper and I didn't find a single mention of homology. Instead, they talk about sequence identity, misspelled as identify, which is also a common term. (laughs) Also, you were wondering where 67% comes from. A possible answer is that 67% equals two thirds equals 66.66 rounded to a whole percentage number. Best Roman. Um, So thanks, Roman. I know that sometimes I can um, be a little... uh, sloppy with those terms. And so I appreciate your nitpick. Yeah, yeah. I think immunologists tend to be very nitpicky, but then when we talk about genetic things, we get a little sloppy. <laughs> <We're> so. like, <laughs> uh, yeah, we all, we all, uh, I mean, I hear a lot of people using the word strain when it's not right, but they just yeah. throw it out there. And, you know, sometimes when you're talking, you don't necessarily use the right words. It's, you know, it's a funny disconnect. I understand that completely, but I was, this was nailed into me years ago. You know, there's no such thing as percent homology, but I still will forget it from time to time. Because you go, when you're talking, you're going, oh, what word is the right one to use? Because you haven't used it enough. (laughs) And unless you use a word enough, you're Mm -hmm. not going to use it always correctly. Uh, Steph. Yeah, so thank you, Roman. We're always up for being corrected here. (laughs) All right, Rich writes, Dear esteemed immune host, can I thoroughly recommend TWIV 684 Persistence of SARS-CoV-2 Immune Memory released the 22nd of November to immune listeners, especially the Shane Crotty conversation. One point Shane made got me thinking. Around 75 minutes into the podcast, Shane referred to the work of Stan Perlman um, on SARS-1, which found that CD4 T cells alone, rather than specific B cells or cytotoxic uh, CD4, the eight T cells were able to control SARS in animals. <clears throat> this was the first time I have come across the suggestion that a CD4 T cell is able to control the response to a pathogen without involving B cells or cytotoxic CD8 T cells. Assuming I have this right, I have the immune experts. Any thoughts on how this could occur? I immediately thought of interferon gamma activation macrophages, but presumably it could be via priming of epithelial cells, increased MHC expression, or some natural killer cell activation. Keep up the great podcasting, Rich. I thought this was more of a question for immune than TWIV. And yes, CD4 T cells do more than just help B cells. They do secrete interferon gamma that can then stimulate CD8 T cells to be to undergo their cytotoxic functions. They can secrete things like perforin and granzyme, which are really cytolytic chemicals. Mm-hmm. You don't, we don't really think of them that way, but they do secrete them. And I went back to that paper and, you know, they did both the experiment where 
they gave, I think it was encoded in a viral vector, an epitope specific for CD4 T cells, um, SARS specific epitope. And that was the way that they were able to deliver this um, directed response to CD4 T cells. But then they also repeated the experiment by deleting CD4 T cells with an antibody and, and saw similar effects. I think this speaks to the when we talk, we talk a lot about antibodies in the context of SARS-2 infection because that's what we can measure very easily in blood. It does not mean that those cells are not important. And in fact, I would imagine that sustained immunity, having a more durable immune response is going to rely on these resident T cells, possibly in the lung mm -hmm. and, and in the mucosa. And in that paper, it was interesting that the T cell specificities were directed against the N protein, which mm -hmm. has the N protein has greater sequence similarity between different <laughs> coronaviruses, <laughs> not homology sequence similarity, then spike. And so I think it's interesting to think about the divergence of the types of immune responses you get against the different proteins and what that means for long-term immunity. Any any other uh, favorite anecdotes about CD4 T cells protecting? Uh, Just that you know, I was I was reading about this, you know, and the cytolytic capacity of CD4 T cells, and it was described quite a long time ago in like the 80s and 90s, um, and people just kind of pushed it aside because CD8 T cells dominated in the in the mm -hmm. uh, cytolytic protective activity, and then we all got sidetracked with different CD types, uh, type one and type two, <laughs> and then it expanded into type you know, nine and 17, all the other ones. And uh, we, we kind of put it to the side, but I think it's reemerging now because when people are doing um, single cell sequencing analysis and they're looking at the gene signatures of different T cell subsets, including the CD4 T cells, which they don't express any CD8, but then they also express perforin and gramzyme, which were like, wait, why are they doing that? Because those are CD8 <laughs> T cell molecules. But then people remember and they go back and they look in the literature and they, oh, they actually knew about this before. We just forgot about it. But yeah, so the, uh, they can also use not just perforin and gramzyme, but they can cell cell contact and use fast, fast ligand, which is another killing mechanism as well. And so they do have cytolytic capacity for sure. The example I always give is uh, herpes stromal keratitis, hmm. where you, people get herpes infections of the eye, which can lead to blindness. And the causative agent in the CD4 positive T cells, which go into the infected area, and it's just them, and they secrete cytokines that damage the, uh, the stromal mm -hmm. cells and makes it opaque after multiple infections. They get mm -hmm. so opaque that you can't see anymore. Mm. CD4 T cells. And the students always say, how do CD4 T cells do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think it's a combination of cytokines on mm -hmm. the target cells uh, that you are, you suggested, um, possibly upregulation of MHC on molecule on um, you know cells like uh, the in the keratitis example, but also then direct direct lysis or killing through perfin and granzyme and fast ligand. So they, I think they have multiple ways that they can mediate mm -hmm. those effects. Yeah. All right. Let's do one more, Cindy. Ah, oh, it's up to me. Okay. Uh, okay. We're at Mark. Yes. Yep. Mark yep. writes, Dear Immune, it is currently 89 Fahrenheit and 57% humidity in Bangkok at 1800 hours. Wow. We have three additional, I love this. We have three additional <laughs> COVID cases reported today with a total of year to date, 3,878 mm -hmm. reported cases and 60 deaths. <laughs> I, I love the comment. Boy, if we only had to worry about those few. Um, yeah. But I guess uh, for them, that that's a lot. So, mm -hmm. you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't judge. It's just like mm -hmm. 300,000 in, in the U.S. or whatever is, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a lot. Anyway, um, in case you have not seen this already, this report is a good summary with numerous links to additional information and databases regarding diagnostics relating to SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. Best regards, Mark in Bangkok. And he links to to um, a document that I couldn't necessarily open because it said it was, uh, oh, there it goes. Um, and I, this, this document is from the National Academies um, Press and it's called Rapid Expert Consultation on Critical Issues in Diagnostic Testing for the COVID-19 Pandemic. And it was published in November 9th of 2020, so quite recently. And it really summarizes um, a lot of different diagnostic tests that have been um, developed. And uh, the goal here um, was to compare... Uh, 
contracts to 22 biomedical diagnostic companies to support the development and manufacture of laboratory-based point-of-care COVID-19 tests doing different technologies. And um, they identified four critical areas in developing diagnostic testing and strategies to reduce the number of infections and deaths. And so they had a whole bunch of, of... uh, things that they compared, including RT-PCR, which I think is the one that most of us are familiar with, as well as point-of-care testing, um, testing strategies, which ones are the best ones, and what are the trade-offs in performance versus uh, you know, how quickly you can, how, how frequently you can test the turnaround time, sensitivity and specificity, and next generation testing. What, what do we need um, to centralize testing systems and high throughputs and, and less expensive alternatives? And I'm going to sneeze, sorry. Yeah, it's a nice, bless you. It's a <laughs> Excuse nice me, summary. sorry. It's a good summary. <laughs> um, yeah, so maybe we can put that link in there yep. if people are interested in, in what types of tests are available and... Um, advantages and disadvantages and so forth. I think it's really nice. I think the important thing to take away is how rapidly uh, and how many different types of tests have been developed. And some of the information, you know, we've we've been focusing on the immune response and what you learn from that. But I think there's a lot of uh, information being learned about how you develop a diagnostic test, some things that you can um, give on to, to get more information in a more rapid period of time. I know um, the, the test here at Cornell, um, I, when when I heard first heard the sensitivity and specificity data, I was like, oh God. But the fact with how frequently you can um, sample in the anterior nares and, you know, compliance, you, you, you gain what you lo- might lose in sensitivity mm. and it works. So, yeah. so thinking about what you need to trade off to be able to widespread sample and get data back quickly, I think offsets some of the limitations that you might have in other areas of a diagnostic test. So I think those are really important. Yeah, I, one of the things we go back to the beginning of the episode, what surprises us or what mm-hmm. surprised us about, I, I just thought that we could have at-home testing. I mean, in this country, mm-hmm. it's the most wealthy country in the world and understanding there's limitations and sensitivity, but it would allow people to make decisions that could save lives. I just, I, we can make them quickly, but I guess to implement, I guess it's manufacturing or, I, I don't know. I just, it surprises me that we're a year almost out and we don't have at-home. I mean, we do. I know there's some approved, but in terms of a big mass rollout. Yeah, hmm. unfortunately, we don't have lick a stick, which would really be a game changer. You well, know. they have spit a tube. Yeah. Um, they they <laughs> they they're doing that. They're doing that here now. You can so it's not at home testing, right? But you can go mm-hmm. home. I mean, you can go to the sampling station and pick up a saliva tube, take yeah. it home, fill it, and bring it back. Hmm. So it's not perfect, but uh, we're getting somewhere, I guess, because yeah, they, I, you know yeah. people standing there trying to get three mil of spit. Was taking a really long time. That's a lot. That's <laughs> who knows how much aerolized, aerosolizing around yeah, all the yeah, other yeah. people who are also spitting in tubes? They're like, just take it home. <laughs> bite your tongue. Bite your tongue. That's what Kathy Spindler says. If you want to make saliva. Oh, oh. ow. Oh. She said, that's what the, okay. that's what singers do when their throats are dry. They bite their tongue. You make saliva and then you swallow it. Interesting. Interesting. How about that? The things you learn. <laughs> the more I did you not, know. I did not know that. <laughs> I am too. I am surprised we don't have at-home testing. I, yeah. I agree. Um, it, yeah, I, I think the manufacturing is not the issue. I think the test development is okay. is the issue. Yeah, especially for rapid at-home, you know, lateral flow type things. It, I, sure. I was speaking to a company. You know, someone sent me a, a rapid lateral flow antibody test, which I did last month, and uh, he said, you know, it's really hard to to get these. The lick a stick concept, he said, for antigen is even harder. And that's why they're not mm-hmm. out yet. They're just hard to I develop. Sure. Right, sure. You need but the you specific would think, antibodies. You need to manufacture the antibodies. Yeah. And, and you have to make sure, you know, you have to pick a conserved epitope that's not going to change, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, just, right. it's not easy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nevertheless, yeah, sure. I agree. Seems to me that we could have done it. The question, but, uh, I guess, is can we learn from this and can we... Uh, develop something that, like like the mRNA vaccine we have now, that's so easy to manufacture with a, a variant that comes out or a new virus that comes out. Mm-hmm. As long as we know what to target, 
which, you know, that's that's an issue, agreed. But if we know what to target, you can you can just start manufacturing really rapidly. Could we think of a test where you're using an approach that could be modified really rapidly and then just uh, put into a pre-existing platform. I don't know if people are doing that, but it would be something to think about for sure. I hope so. I hope so. It depends when the next pandemic is. If it's in a hundred years, there's not going to be any memory, right? Just like there wasn't from 1918 and people are going to yeah. forget. But sooner, you know, it's probably going to be a flu pandemic in 10 or 20 years. So probably, hopefully we do. All right. That is immune number 40. That's the last one for 2020. Say goodbye, uh, yeah, happy new year to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, goodbye. Good riddance. I thought it was going to be a great year, but it turned out to be pretty bad for everybody, <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, here's to 2021. Uh, you can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash immune. Send your questions and comments to immune at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us financially. We, we thank those of you who do. And if you're interested, microbe.tv slash contribute. Cindy Leifer is at Cornell and over on Twitter, Cindy Leifer. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. Steph Langle is at Duke University. Stephanie Langle on Twitter. Thanks, Steph. <clears throat> Uh-oh, we lost your sound. You're muted. There's no sound. Did you turn oh, the well. switch off? Well, she says bye. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're not going to hear oh, well. the la the last no, words of 2020 from Steph are muted. the The most frequently used words in this year, I, you were muted. Uh, <laughs> Brian Barker is at Drew University. Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. Mm -hmm. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal. Thanks for listening, everyone, for this year. See you next year. Have a great new year. You've been listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next year. Mm -hmm.